Hello. We're glad you've joined us for our first of six 2017 SYNC D3 webinars. Today's presentation will be on the topic of disease models. We've talked on using IPSCs and genome engineering to build disease models and 3D cell culture, developing better in vitro cell models for drug discovery. I am Julia O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. It's brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. Thermo Fisher is a world leader in serving science whose mission is to enable customers to make the world healthier, cleaner, and safer. Thermo Fisher Scientific helps their customers accelerate life sciences research, solve complex analytical challenges, improve patient diagnostics, and increase laboratory productivity. For more information, please visit www.thermoscientific.com. Let's get started. You can pose questions to the speakers during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them into the Q&A box, which will open when you click the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the slide window, click on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support button found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the green Q&A button at lower left. I now present today's speakers, David Piper, PhD, R&D Director for the Cell Biology and Synthetic Biology Businesses at Thermo Fisher Scientific, and Mark Kennedy, PhD, an R&D scientist at the Thermo Fisher Scientific Cell Biology ADME Talks Group. Dr. Piper has led teams at Thermo Fisher Scientific for over 10 years in the development of products and services for cellular engineering, biochemical assays, and cell-based assays, for the screening of multiple target classes and next-generation solutions for drug discovery using IPSC-based approaches. These efforts are directed at generating more pathophysiologically relevant cell models through the use of reprogramming, stem cell culture, characterization and differentiation, genomic engineering, and assay development. He now leads teams that provide molecular biology and cellular biology services, including cDNA library synthesis, high-throughput cloning, CRISPR and TALON design and generation, lentivirus generation, BACMAM virus generation, cell engineering assay development, lentiarray CRISPR libraries, and functional genomics screening. As a Cancer Research Training Award postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory of Terry T. Yamaguchi at the National Cancer Institute, Dr. Kennedy studied gene regulatory network controlled by Wink signaling in models of mammalian embryogenesis. He has published many peer-reviewed research articles in leading journals such as PNAS and Development. At Thermo Fisher Scientific, Dr. Kennedy is part of a team that focuses on the development of new in vitro 3D cell culture models. His ongoing work focuses on the utilization of human embryonic stem cells, IPSCs, and primary cells, and their application in steroids, organoids, and co-culture systems. The speaker's complete bios are found on the LabRoots website. Dr. Piper will now begin his presentation. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction, and I'd just like to greet all of our participants and say thank you for joining us this morning, this afternoon, or this evening, depending on where you may be, uh, and allowing us to share some of our recent advancements in the realm of iPSC-derived disease models. Um, to start with, I just kind of want to ground everyone. I think the approach and the idea here is relatively straightforward and, and is a thought that people have had uh, really probably since the advent of the isolation of human embryonic stem cells in 1998 by Jamie Thompson in his laboratory and later, and particularly in 2006, the advent of induced pluripotent stem cells by the advancements of Shinya Yamanaka and again Jamie Thompson and their groups. Um, and what we'd like to try to understand is how human biology works. There are a number of, of inputs that we have that are variables, our genetics, our environment, our nutrition various drugs that we may use to treat disease or that people may use in, in recreational ways that impact 
a number of outputs that we can elucidate as symptoms that we feel as humans and, and can point to, uh, as well as biomarkers that may be measured through instrumentation, and of course a number of outcomes that may uh, occur in terms of loss of mobility or function or even, uh, of course, loss of life. And what we'd like to do is try to understand that with a relatively straightforward model in our discovery processes uh, where we would build a model to predict these outputs and translate them to the organisms. And we start with cells that we have, again, a number of inputs that we might control to mimic these variables through the overexpression of genes or the knockdown or knockout of genes by changing the media systems that the cells are in, whether that be the media itself or the supplementation or the co-culture or the three-dimensional nature that we'll Mark, Mark will talk about later, as well as, of course, treating them with various compounds that might be used as therapeutics. And we can measure the outputs of those cells in terms of gene expression, protein function, uh, various aspects of cell health, and many other cell phenotypes that are relevant to the pathophysiological state of the cell, and ultimately translate that back to the human being, and again, those symptoms and biomarkers. So as I said, in, in 2006, following the advent of induced pluripotent stem cell reprogramming techniques, uh, advanced by Shinya Yamanaka and Jamie Thompson's labs, uh, it became relatively quickly clear to people that we could use these cells shown on the top left that are pluripotent and become, can become any cell type in the body essentially and can be kept in culture for many, many divisions. We can take these from patients that have no clinical disease uh, phenotype or genotype or we could take them from folks that are uh, displaying specific disease phenotypes and genotypes and using those patient samples, we can uh, reprogram uh, skin or blood to create these iPSCs and then further address the genomic nature of that sample to either take a wild type cell and insert a mutation or take a diseased sample and revert a mutation and thereby create an isogenic pair shown on the bottom left in the sort of pink tan color. And then these two isogenic paired cells can be differentiated into a cell type of interest, shown here, uh, neurons, for instance, to study diseases such as Parkinson's disease. And phenotypic comparisons can be made using a variety of cell-based assays and indicators that may allow us to uh, quantitate cellular function that is specifically relevant to that disease in that cell type that is, again, specifically relevant to the tissue type that's affected in the human body. And we have over the years, over the past five to seven years, really generated an entire portfolio of products to help support that effort, um, beginning with the patient where we have media systems that allow you to culture those blood cells or those fibroblasts and we have genetic uh, instrumentation like our ion torrent uh, PGM or Proton or S5 to characterize the genetic, uh, the, the, the genotype of those patients. We have a number of ways to reprogram those cells, uh, perhaps the most efficient of which is our Cytotune Sendai virus, and I'll touch on, on that momentarily in a little bit more detail. We've developed culture systems, uh, our Essential 8 being a, a very standard uh, system that was developed by Jamie Thompson's lab and you, has been used very widely to culture and expand cells. And we have a number of ways to characterize those iPSCs, antibodies for specific proteins that we know to be expressed by pluripotent stem cells or their progeny, as well as a very comprehensive gene panel that we call the PSC TACMAM Human Scorecard to understand the gene expression of iPSCs as well as their progeny. We have developed a number of engineering uh, systems based on technology associated with both Talons and the CRISPR-Cas9 systems. And I'll go into a little more detail about both of those as that is really the crux of this talk. And then we've developed some media systems that allow for the induction or differentiation of iPSCs to a number of downstream progeny. 
and that has uh, we've been coupling those with our measurement systems from both our high throughput screening teams and our high content imaging teams and our molecular probes franchises to help develop systems that allow us to measure function from those cells that again can be equated back to the human biology that we're interested in. A few years ago, we embarked on a collaboration with the Parkinson's Institute, and I'm just showing that here quickly, and, and this sort of references back to that workflow. Uh, so you can see the colored boxes that I sort of went through before in terms of getting patient samples from donors that had known clinical Parkinsonian uh, symptoms and genotypes. We took those fibroblasts, we cultured them in our media systems, we reprogrammed them with our Cytotune Sendivirus to make IPSCs, which were again characterized with various tools. Uh, these were then edited. Uh, at the time using our Talon-based gene editing to specifically modify the disease-relevant genes and revert them to wild type. And then we used our neural induction media to create neural stem cells, and further those cells were used to differentiate into dopaminergic neurons and glia. And we looked at a number of functional assays in these various progeny to look for phenotypes that varied in the wild type versus the disease samples. Uh, on the left are a number of, of uh, patient donor samples that indicate various disease mutations or spontaneous mutations as well as controls. So we looked at a number of different cell lines. And, you know, for the most part, this, this workflow was very predictable. Um, and was relatively straightforward to accomplish. When we look at reprogram, reprogramming efficiency here, we tested a number of densities and using the various samples that are indicated here and as shown on the previous slide, I believe the age groups were quite varied as well. Um, but irrespective of the age of the donor, or the specific disease associated with the donor, which do tend to impact our ability to reprogram, we were able to get efficiencies anywhere from 0.01% to 0.3%, and these numbers have, have uh, improved considerably over the past few years as well. Uh, but these, these efficiencies were plenty uh, to allow us to choose multiple clones from each sample and move those clones forward for further expansion and characterization. And again, that characterization was generally carried out using a series of antibodies uh, for known pluripotent uh, proteins, OCT4, for example. Uh, we also looked at extracellular surface proteins that are correlated with pluripotency, like TRAW1-81, TRAW1-60. Uh, and we looked at these on our Floyd imaging stations, as well as quantitated them using our Attune acoustic focusing cytometer, and you can see on the bottom uh, that we have about 88% of the cells uh, there being stained with NANOG and SSCA4, indicating that we have a highly uh, pluripotent culture uh, of great homogeneity in, these, uh, in this particular IPSC sample from uh, donor PD3. We also characterized the gene expression of those IPSCs using our TACMAM HPSC scorecard which we developed as a collaboration with Dr. Alex Meisner at Harvard based on one of his landmark publications where he looked at hundreds of genes uh, and the genomic and epigenomic signature of ESCs and IPSCs to understand how, uh, how they overlap and how close uh, those two types of pluripotent stem cells are in terms of their gene expression patterns. Uh, and from that, we are able to work with him to reduce that content to a smaller set of key predictive markers on the order of 90 genes that we could put in a single plate that would allow uh, us and our customers to rapidly evaluate the pluripotent nature of the IPSC itself, as well as embryoid bodies derived from that IPSC and either look at all the specific genes if desired or get sort of a, a thumbs up, thumbs down based on those gene panels as they relate to a database of about 13 
well-characterized iPSCs uh, that set the standard for that gene expression panel. So you can see here we have a couple different iPSCs on the left, uh, one that came from a donor that had multiple systems atrophy and a spontaneous um, uh, presentation of Parkinson's, and then on the right, a patient that uh, was a control that had no clinical phenotype. And the sort of yellow single dots show you that when we look at those iPSCs and that 90 gene panel, uh, overall those cells expressed the pluripotent markers as expected when compared, again, to that benchmark of 13 iPSCs. And then when we generated embryoid bodies through a non-directed differentiation by removing uh, FGF and allowing the cells to form EBs in suspension, uh, we then looked at those samples and we saw upregulation of genes that are typically expressed in ectodermal, endodermal, and mesodermal layers, and a downregulation of the pluripotent genes, again, as expected. Now, the reprogramming, the characterization, again, relatively straightforward. We had no problems moving those pieces forward, and, and they really behaved as expected. And we think that in terms of generating uh, cells from patients, that is not really a hurdle for us today. Uh, however, there are, have been significant challenges in our ability to edit these cells. And we, we know uh, many have embarked on these, uh, these tasks. And certainly, there are no, uh, there's no dearth of publications in the area. We've seen many, many different examples. Uh, but I think what is not always appreciated in the publications is the amount of time uh, and labor and tedium associated with some of these manipulations. So to begin with, low cleavage and low homology-directed recombina recombination efficiencies, uh, which we often see when delivering tools to iPSCs, require that we generate many clones to find the reversion or the introduction of the disease mutation in a homozygous uh, single cell clone. Um, once we've put those tools into a pool of cells, the cells need to be singularized. And they need to be singularized for the transfection. They also need to be sing kept singular post-transfection to allow us to plate cells at a very low density to form well-separated colonies relatively well known in the field that stem cells do not like being alone. Um, this puts a lot of stress on them. It can often cause cell death. It can cause abnormalities in the karyotype of the cells where you may select for cells that create uh, duplications of chromosomes or portions of chromosomes that may give them growth advantages. Uh, so it can be a real challenge. In addition, the cells can be somewhat motile. Uh, so even though you've created well-separated colonies, in many cases, the colonies do not wind up being homogeneous. In these situations where we plate the cells at these limited dilutions, it does require the manual isolation of those colonies. And we really want to take half of that colony uh, and use it for expansion and another half for screening so that we can get rid of the cells uh, that aren't what we want and reduce the amount of colonies that we're keeping in culture. And then finally, again, once we identify colonies that have what we want, oftentimes we need to replate them uh, because they're not necessarily a homogeneous clone, uh, and we may need to dilute them down again in order to achieve that. So if I take that stem cell workflow I showed you and break it down into the pieces that are more uh, germane to the disease model construction and engineering piece, we think about delivery and engineering. And again, what we've used previously are our gene art precision towels. Um, and we have cloned and expand those cells in essential eight medium using limited plating dilution strategies. And we have screened those typically using either TACMAM uh, allele-specific competitive SNP assays or ion torrent sequencing. We, during those projects, used our neural induction media to generate neural stem cells and then downstream neurons from that point, and as mentioned, had focused principally on cell health assays. So what have we done lately? In terms of delivery, oh. 
that, let me point out Ed, again, as mentioned, the, the, the key piece for tedium here is this circle between clone expand and screen expand. And, and as I said, uh, a key roadblock here was the inability to get single cells uh, and create homogeneous colonies off the first round uh, to allow for the type of uh, more rigorous screening and predictable outcomes that we get from cells that tend to be easily uh, take delivery easily and, and, and withstand sorting easily. So what, what have we done lately? Um, when it comes to delivery and engineering, we've made significant improvements to our GeneArt CRISPR-Cas9 system. Um, and some of these uh, are available already as an early access. Uh, we have a new version of our Cas9 nuclease protein that can be used with guide RNAs to create a ribonucleoprotein complex that can be delivered directly to cells to drive high editing efficiency. We also have our perfect match TALs, and these are talons that do not require, have the uh, 5 prime T requirement. Uh, so these can be addressed to any location in the human genome. And a point that I'll make there is it's becoming more and more clear that homology-directed recombination can be highly facilitated by using smaller pieces of DNA and creating cut sites, creating double-stranded breaks very close to the single nuclei, nucleotide polymorphism that you would like to change or introduce. So in many cases, we may not have a CRISPR that guide RNA that can address a specific site due to the PAM requirement on the 3' prime end of that CRISPR-Cas9. So if you find yourself working with mutations where a CRISPR uh, guide RNA will not cut within a small stretch, say 10 base pairs of the SNP, you may want to consider using a perfect match towel as that will really dramatically increase your HDR efficiencies. And then finally, we've also created a stable Cas9 IPSC, which I'll talk about today, where the Cas9 nuclease is expressed in the IPSC, and we can very easily and effectively deliver guide RNAs to achieve high cleavage efficiencies and high HDR efficiencies. We've made some very significant improvements to our media systems and have launched this year a StemFlex medium that has been key to the recovery following electroporation uh, or uh, lipid introduction of guide RNAs, as well as allowed us to support single cell IPSC sorting, which I'll talk about today. That same media has allowed us to expand those clones effectively, uh, and once we've identified them, uh, to bulk them up to a large size where we can go ahead and then characterize and differentiate them into a number of cell types. And now, in addition to neural stem cells, our media teams have developed directed monolayer differentiation kits that allow us to generate cardiomyocytes, midbrain dopaminergic neurons, as well as cortical neurons and glia. And finally, we're using those cells in measurement systems in both our high content imaging platforms using our Cell Insight CX5 and our molecular probes reagents, as well as high throughput cell-based assays, including, for example, functional assays that allow us to visualize and quantitate things such as calcium flux and release or plasma membrane voltage or potassium flux uh, that are important for cells like cardiomyocytes and neurons in their excitation uh, contraction coupling or their excitate, excitation secretion. So what I'll focus on here first are our improvements around delivery and engineering. And as I mentioned, uh, for the purposes of this talk, I will focus on the Cas9 IPSC. Um, but please realize that we have significant significant improvements in efficiency again uh, with our new Cas9 protein as well as the use of our perfect match towels to address SNPs that may not be near a guide RNA uh, pattern. So what is our Cas9 IPSC and how did we generate it? Um, we took our Gibco IPSC uh, episomal line that is available in our catalog, a well-characterized IPSC can be used to generate many downstream progeny. 
And using a lentiviral construct that is part of our Lenti Array CRISPR library platforms, uh, we have a lentivirus that encodes a Cas9 nuclease and includes a blastocedin resistance cassette. We introduced that lentiviral construct to our human episomal iPSC Cas9 line. We selected with blastocedin and chose colonies uh, that we characterized, and I'll go through the characterization of, of some of those uh, that ultimately led to us choosing uh, the colony that had the best-looking morphology, growth, and characteristics uh, that match the wild-type Cas9 line. So post-selection, uh, we examine these colonies for their morphology. So you can hopefully see that on the top left in the photomicrograph. And these cells look as expected, similar to the wild type Cas9 in our feeder free essential eight uh, media systems. We ran a karyotype, a standard karyotype analysis on those cells shown in the top middle panel, and there was no change in karyotype uh, from the Lenti uh, delivery uh, in the Cas9 expressing iPSCs as compared to wild type. We looked at uh, pluripotency markers using anti-TRA 1-60 antibody, and we ran the TACMAM HPSC scorecard shown on the bottom left. And you can see that the GIBCO IPSC shown in back black dots and the Cas9 human IPSC shown in red dots are nearly identical uh, for their expression of self-renewal markers uh, as well as ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. And these line up very well with our expectations compared to the benchmark of the 13 IPSC and ESCs that are used in our database. So in summary, our Cas9 IPSC retained normal morphology, normal karyotype, and had a pluripotency similar to our parental line as measured by gene expression. Next, we differentiated those cells in a non-directed way, again, removing FGF and forming embryoid bodies. And we examined the gene expression of those embryoid bodies using the TACMAM scorecard. And on top, you'll see that the EBs on day 7 and 21, uh, shown in the middle and the bottom row, had a marked decrease in the self-renewal markers with an increasing uh, increase in expression of the ectodermal, mesodermal, and endodermal markers, again, as expected. And some of these markers we also examined using immunocytochemistry. So on the bottom left, you can see staining of the nuclei with DAPI and beta-3 tubulin, a common ectodermal marker uh, shown in red. And on the bottom right panel, again, you'll see DAPI uh, staining the nuclei in blue and staining of smooth muscle actin uh, as a mesodermal marker. Uh, so this showed us that the Cas9 iPSC can differentiate through EBs to all three germ layers, as evidenced by both genetic and protein expression analysis. We further tested those Cas9 iPSCs to understand if they could be directed towards specific progeny through our monolayer differentiations using our kits. And here you can see uh, fluorescent micrographs of cardiomyocytes at 10x and 20x, where we've stained the nuclei in blue with our nuke blue reagent and used anti-cardiac troponin uh, shown in green with an Alexa Fluor 48 label to uh, demonstrate evidence of cardiac protein expression. We also use these cells to generate floor plate progenitors, which are an intermediate to our uh, midbrain floor plate derived dopaminergic neurons. And here you'll see on the left our Cas9 iPSC derived dopaminergic neuron progenitors, and on the right the wild type Gibco iPSC derived dopaminergic progenitors. And you'll see staining for our expected markers, FOXA2, LIMX1, and OTX2, uh, and a downregulation of SOX1. And essentially, our staining for both uh, the GIBCO IPSC and the Cas9 IPSC look equivalent, suggesting that the Cas9 IPSC can efficiently make midbrain floor plate progenitors. Those cells were used to further generate our dopaminergic neurons. And here on top, you'll see the wild-type iPSCs 
and on the bottom, the Cas9 iPSCs that were used to generate these neurons, and staining for tyrosine hydroxylase, a key enzyme in the biosynthetic pathway for dopamine, as well as beta-3 tubulin, a key neuroectodermal marker, and merge staining of those markers and uh, the nuclei shown in blue on the far right. So again, we see immunocytochemical evidence that our Cas9 iPSC can be efficiently uh, differentiated into dopaminergic neurons. Now the final question was, can we use these cells to create double-stranded breaks and introduce single nucleotide polymorphisms? And here, instead of reverting a patient sample, we were asking the question, can we use this unified chassis to create a set of protocols for many different SNPs that may underlie different diseases and generate a system that would allow people to model monogenic diseases that are necessary and sufficient to drive uh, the phenotypes that one would expect to see in these cells. So on the top left, you see a bar graph for uh, guide RNAs that were directed against cardiac troponin uh, in the first two sets of bar graphs, against HPRT in the third set, and against uh, beta-2 microglobulin in the far right. And we are looking here at the cleavage efficiency, which again is generated from our genomic cleavage detection kit, where you create a PCR fragment across the site uh, where the indel or the SNP is. And if you've made a change, heteroduplexes form in, that, uh, in those PCR products, and those heteroduplexes can be cut by an endonuclease, which will create a specific gel banding pattern, which you can see on the bottom left, where the first row under B2M gRNA or the first row under HPRT indicate uh, no editing, uh, and the other uh, bands uh, show the cleavage efficiency. You can see the the smaller bands that result from the endonuclease activity when we add increasing amounts of guide RNA uh, from 0 to 50 to 100 to 200 to 400 nanograms. Uh, and these were delivered using our neon transfection system, electroporated into the iPSCs, uh, and they were recovered in Stemplex media, again, and quantitated by the GCD assay. So that allowed us to get very high indel percentages, as shown by the table on the right in the middle column for a number of genes and a number of different guide RNAs tested for each of those genes. We had indel frequencies that ranged anywhere from 23 to as high as 78%. Now additionally, we included small DNA oligos to revert uh, or to in, in introduce the SNPs associated with these diseases. And in order to assess the HDR efficiency, we ran next-gen sequencing across those SNPs and looked at the percentage of reads that had either the wild-type nucleotide or the desired disease-relevant nucleotide. And you can see those uh, percentages on, on the far right. Uh, and we saw anywhere from 7 to 37 percent HDR, which was really a significant uptick compared to what we had seen previously uh, when we had first run uh, our editing uh, workflow and our patient-derived samples uh, using DNA-based plasmids for our talents. So we were very excited about this. Now, another question we had was, is there sustained expression of Cas9 as we differentiate those cells? Uh, and this is showing you that as we generate floor plate progenitors to create dopaminergic neurons, we can clearly visualize Cas9 on a Western blot. And um, that gave us some thoughts about how we may be able to leverage uh, these cells later uh, from both the wild type and the diseased uh, isogenic pairs. So we could see clear Cas9 expression in the floor plate progenitors. Uh, and furthermore, we could show that we could actually edit in those Cas9 iPSC-derived progenitors. And here you see, again, our genomic cleavage assays for HPRT, LARC2, uh, alpha-synuclein, 
uh, and two different loci for LAR2. And again, looking at 0, 50, 100, 200, and 400 nanograms of guide RNA introduced to these progenitor cells. And we're getting as high as 60% cleavage based on that genomic cleavage assay using lipofectamine-based delivery of those guides, so using our RNAi max to deliver uh, in vitro transcribed guide RNAs. So that also uh, has given us a lot of, of thought about how we can use these models later downstream to do potentially knockout studies. So the next piece I want to talk about is how we have made some improvements in our media systems that have supported the uh, generation of clones following the introduction of these genome editing tools. So it's all well and good that we've improved the editing efficiency from the standpoint of cleavage as well as homology-directed recombination. But what do we do with those pools next? So using our new StemFlex media system, we've been able to show that we can get phenomenal recovery post-electroporation of the system. We can uh, sequence those pools and understand very effectively what our efficiency is, which can inform us as to how many single cells we might need to sort. And this media, as I will show you, has begun to support those activities directly. So the team here uh, in Carlsbad, in, in collaboration with our media development teams in Frederick, have taken that StemFlex media and developed a very stringent sorting protocol to isolate single and viable pluripotent stem cells. So one of the first steps is to simply create a set of very stringent gates using both forward and side scatter to exclude not just cell debris, but to be very clear and, and stringent around uh, excluding multiple, any potential multiple cell clumps. We've also used propidium iodide to exclude dying cells, and we've used anti-TRA 1-60 to prioritize our gates around pluripotent cells. So we're quite confident that we are pulling out single viable pluripotent cells through this sorting exercise. We drop these cells into our StemFlex media, and I'm showing you here a comparison of, of that media with some of uh, the commonly used media systems that come from both us and other vendors. Uh, and on the left, you see the percent clone formation from cells uh, dropped into media systems without Revitacell, which is a supplementation that we use uh, uh, that includes a very specific ROC inhibitor and other uh, supportive supplements. Uh, when we use simply the media systems uh, using StemFlex, we're able to get almost a 30% recovery of single cells. And if we clone three or five, we get even higher levels. And when you do clone three or five, in many cases, uh, the large bulk of those cells actually do die. Uh, and those systems may, uh, and, and those numbers can support the generation of single cells. But frankly, with a 30% recovery of single cells, we're doing just fine. And we're happy to sort more plates to know that we do, in fact, have a very clear and homogeneous culture. Now, shown on the right is an improvement in those recovery efficiencies in all of the media systems we tested when we include Revitacell. Um, and I should also point out that we're dropping these single cells uh, onto a laminin 521 substrate. So uh, we offer all of those systems uh, in our catalog, our StemFlex media, uh, our Revitacell supplement, and our laminin 521 uh, substrate. And this has really been a game changer for us uh, in order to generate effectively and predictably single cell homogeneous clones. Now on the next slide, um, I had a couple movies, and I'm afraid that we won't be able to share them with you. But um, what we did do was we kept a constant monitor of these single cells over time. And in the wells uh, where clones arose, we were able to wind back that video and examine the entire well and prove to ourselves physically and microscopically that the clone was, in fact, derived from a single cell. 
And of course, this can also be verified through next generation sequencing by doing thousands of reads uh, at a specific location and identifying that you have you know, 98% or higher uh, reads that have the mutation or the wild type or 50-50 as the case may be. And, and statistically, that quantitation gives us a great level of confidence uh, that we have clones that came from a single genotype. So the next piece then was, again, how do we screen and expand these cells? Uh, and here again, the stem flex media has been critical to our ability to take those single cells and get them to a level uh, where we can easily sequence them all uh, and then further expand the winners. And what I'm showing you here are the pools which we had, again, generated uh, through electroporation and sequenced using next-gen sequencing to understand the HDR efficiencies, which I showed you before. Uh, and those were somewhere between, again, 7 and 40 percent, roughly. Um, and here what I'm showing you are the sequencing results from all of the clones that we generated uh, from those pools. So for instance, in this first pie chart, we had a LARC2 G2019S introduction. And when we had done uh, the NGS on the pool, we saw that 26% of our reads indicated we had uh, a G2019S mutation. And here what you see in the pie chart is when we looked at the clones, 88% of the clones uh, had an indel whereas about 4% of them were homozygote wild type and 8% of them were homozygote SNPs. Now, interestingly, in this particular population, we did not uh, observe any heterozygotes. In the middle, you see another pie chart for LARC2 uh, I2020T. Here we had about 14% uh, of the reads in our pool uh, that indicated we had uh, that mutation. And here we see about 58% of the cells uh, with indels, 38% uh, with uh, wild type, homozygous wild type, and about 2% homozygote SNP or 2% heterozygote SNP. Uh, for alpha-synuclein A30P, we had about 34% HDR. Uh, and when we examined all of the single clones that we sorted, we had actually 48% of them uh, with double homozygote knockouts, or homozygote SNPs, excuse me. Uh, with cardiac troponin T, we had about 11% HDR in the pool, uh, about 2% homozygote SNPs, uh, about 36% wild type, and about 62% uh, indels. And with NAV 1.5, uh, E1053K, we had about 41% HDR in the pool and about 30% homozygote SNPs, uh, about 6% uh, heterozygote, 39% indel, 26% homozygote wild type. So what I think you can appreciate here is that uh, what we get out, um, you know, it, it, it's certainly possible if we were to look at thousands of these cells that the phenotypes or the genotypes that arise might be more stochastically representative of what we see in the pool. But it's more likely that some of these uh, numbers are biased due to uh, aspects of recombination that perhaps we don't fully understand, microhomology, uh, allelic switches, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's certainly curious to us that in some cases we really don't see the heterozygotes and we expect that there are some mechanisms that are underlying that that we don't fully understand today. Uh, but the great news is that single cell clones derived using stem flex and laminin 521 allowed us in all of these five examples to identify homozygous edited clones following our first sort. So our next piece then was to look at differentiation and measuring. Uh, and as I mentioned, again, we've generated an, a number of new media and I'm going to just touch briefly on what we've done using our cardiomyocyte differentiation media. Uh, what we're trying to do is to use this Cas9 iPSC. We'd like to introduce mutations that are associated with each of these cell types and demonstrate that, again, we can introduce monogenic SNPs that have a dominant genotypic effect uh, that will support uh, 
cellular phenotypes that are reflective of the disease. So with the cardiomyocytes, I'll show you some of the cell-based assays uh, that the team has developed uh, using our wild-type Cas9. And now that we've generated these mutants, uh, we'll be looking forward to running these assays on the isogenic pairs. And I hope to share that type of data with you in the future. So using our cardiac uh, differentiation kit and our GIBCO iPSCs, we uh, carried out the differentiation procedure in uh, six and 12 well dishes and then replated those cells into a 3D four well dish for our assays. Uh, and for our assays, we examined the use of Flow4, our calcium indicator, and FlowVolt, uh, a dye that we have uh, based on uh, nanowire technology that allows us to measure the plasma membrane potential. And we imaged uh, and quantitated these on a Hamamatsu FDSS uh, 6000. And on the bottom left, you can see what some of those raw traces look like. Uh, and uh, these uh, indicate various beat rates in the wells based on the various compounds that we've put in the plate. And in the middle, you can see how we characterize sort of the baseline of that beat rate with the green line. Uh, and the peak with the little red pluses, and we can use that to establish a frequency between the peaks, an amplitude from the baseline to the top, uh, et cetera. And by quantitating those features, we can plot that against the concentration of the compounds and understand uh, some aspects of their effects. So in the next slide here, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about how we did that. We loaded the cardiomyocytes using our Flow4 direct reagent, which is a no-wash reagent. So it's very easy to add it uh, simply to the cells and carry out your read. We let that incubate for about 30 minutes. Um, in this case, we did, in fact, change the media, but typically that's not necessary because we do have a quencher there, uh, and that should allow you to simply add and read. We collect data before, during, and after compound treatment. The Hamamatsu FDSS has a liquid injection capability. We ran these compounds titrated as 10-point curves with four replicates per concentration. And we used that to generate concentration response curves from post-treatment data, again, normalized to the pre-treatment data. And of course, we also ran DMS, DMSO controls uh, that were uh, our negatives. So here you see what uh, a set of control cells look like. And again, I apologize that we don't have the video here. But on the top left, uh, you would be able to see uh, clear fluorescent intensity changes that represent the calcium fluctuations that occur both due to voltage-gated calcium channels and the influx of calcium into the cardiomyocytes, as well as calcium-induced calcium release from internal stores that is associated with that excitation-contraction coupling. And on the right, you can see those fluctuations in fluorescence intensity uh, from that well that indicate the essentially the beat rate of those control cells. Then when we add uh, isoproteranol, a known uh, beta-adrenergic uh, agonist that increases beat rate through GPCR signaling and modification of ion channels, we can see an increase in that beat rate, uh, whereas when we use verapamil, a known calcium channel blocker, we can completely obliterate that calcium signal as we expect. So we went ahead and took those first assay feasibility results, and we moved forward and ran a number of times three different runs uh, using high purity cardiomyocytes for all of the runs. Um, we do see some loss of cells. About 4 to 6 percent of the wells uh, did not give us detectable signals, some issues around either cell loading or cell health. And we will continue to optimize around that. Uh, but again, using four replicates, we were able to get the data that we needed. Um, we tested about nine different compounds that have very known, very classic known mechanisms of action at a number of cardiac ion channels uh, and GPCRs, as shown in the middle panel here. Uh, and those compounds, based on those mechanism, mechanisms of action, also have a very clear and known effect on the calcium transients. So those results are shown here, uh, where we have the drug effect on the cardiomyocyte beat rate shown on the top, 
row, as well as the amplitude shown in the middle row, and the duration of those peaks shown on the bottom row. And again, verapamil, you can see with increasing concentrations, uh, obliterates the beat rate and the am beat amplitude and the beat duration uh, because it's a known calcium channel blocker, uh, as is BK. Uh, whereas isoproterenol, uh, a known uh, beta adrenergic agonist uh, that increases beat rate through modulation of ion channels, uh, increases beat rate as you increase concentration, uh, as well as beat amplitude. However, it decreases beat duration. Uh, consistent with our expectations. And on the far right, E4031, a known blocker of the uh, delayed rectifier or commonly called human ether agogo related gene HERG potassium channel, responsible for repolarization of the cardiac action potential and often involved in acquired long QT syndrome or drug induced long QT syndrome. Uh, E4031 has a a noticeable uh, decrease uh, on the beat rate due to its effect on that potassium channel uh, as well as changes to the beat amplitude and beat duration. So this all lined up very well with our expectations in wild type iPSCs and cardiomyocytes and again we look forward to moving those studies forward with some of the mutations that we've introduced. So as I mentioned, we'd like to generate a number of, of isogenic clones in this Cas9 iPSC using our StemFlex media systems to model hypertrophy with mutations in cardiac troponin uh, or Brigada syndrome with mutations in NAV1.5 or LQT syndrome uh, by introducing mutations in KCNH2 or the HERG channel. For Parkinson's disease, we've introduced a number of mutations in alpha-synuclein and LAR2 that should uh, derive specific phenotypes that we expect. Uh, and we have begun differentiating these to relevant cell types, again, using our cardiomyocyte differentiation kit or our dopaminergic neuron differentiation kit, and we're seeing the expected staining of cardiac or uh, dopaminergic neurons. And finally, we'll be using those cell types to develop functional assays and quantitate cellular phenotypes using some of our cell health reagents like Presto Blue to measure cell metabolism or Cyquant Direct to measure DNA content and proliferation uh, or Click at EDU uh, to measure incorporation of nucleotides and proliferation. We'll be looking at excitability through calcium flux with Flow4, potassium flux with Fluxor, uh, and membrane potential with Flovote, and we'll be examining a number of parameters using high content imaging uh, to include but not be limited to cell size, cell health, neurite outgrowth, mitochondrial health, uh, Lewy bodies, protein aggregation, et cetera. And again, look forward to sharing some of that data with you in the future. So we took a system that a few years ago uh, was developed using patient-derived uh, or donor-derived samples where we had reprogrammed them into iPSCs and used gene art precision towels and sorted cells using limited dilution plating that created a very laborious cycle uh, until we were able to get homogeneous clones. And that cycle was not very predictable, uh, and it was quite painful for the bench scientists. We generated neural stem cells, uh, and using those neural stem cells and their downstream neurons and glia, uh, looked at a variety of cell health assays. Today, we've made improvements in all of these areas and generated really a very direct workflow to get from a stem cell to edited clones that are derived from single cells where we can really essentially first time right find double S homozygote SNP, either reversions or, or insertions, and we can use those isogenic pairs to generate a number of different cell types, including cardiomyocytes, dopaminergic neurons, and cortical neurons and glia, and are begin using, beginning to use a, a wide variety of our measurement tools to quantitate these cellular phenotypes. So in summary, uh, our stable Cas9 iPSC exhibited all the expected properties of the wild type iPSC and was able to support high efficiency cleavage and HDR and allows for the cleavage of genes in differentiated progeny. Our improved sorting protocols were supported uh, by our StemFlex media 
and the gating of those, in those protocols supports the isolation of healthy and pluripotent IPSCs. The StemFlex media, in combination with laminin-521, supports a very high efficiency recovery following that sort and allowed for the reliable and predictive recovery and identification of homozygous edited IPSCs. Our clone identification and expansion was dramatically reduced because the combination of the high efficiency HDR and the single cell sorting and recovery supported the expansion of clones that were homozygous and could be easily identified by downstream sequencing. Our differentiation uh, and measurement, we've established proof of principle for our wild type cardiomyocytes and again look forward to looking at these isogenic pairs in the next few months. So we really see a significant reduction in effort and cycle times. This is our goal, to really remove the need for manual clone isolation and repeated subcloning and reduce timelines by months to support the first time right production of isogenic pairs. So with that, I again would like to thank all of the participants for joining us uh, this morning, afternoon, and evening. And I'm happy to take any questions that have arisen over the course of the uh, conversation. Thank you, Dr. Piper, for that informative presentation. I will now turn it over to Dr. Kennedy. Okay, hi. Uh, my name is Mark. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for, for tuning in here today. Um, uh, I'm an R&D scientist in the cell biology program, or more specifically within the Admetox group uh, at Thermo Scientific. Um, and the title of my presentation today is going to be 3D Cell Culture. Developing Better in Vitro Cell Models for Drug Discovery. So my goal with this short talk really is just to give a fairly high level overview of several 3D cell culture models. Uh, primarily, I'll, I'll talk about spheroids and organoids and the promises these systems offer. And then I'll end with a couple brief highlights from published papers that demonstrate the utility of these systems for disease modeling and drug screening. So I'm sure everyone here is familiar with traditional two-dimensional monolayer cultures. Uh, these systems typically consist of growing a cell line uh, of, of interest, like a cancer cell line, uh, by growing it directly on 2D plastic surfaces or sometimes on a two-dimensional surface that's been pre-coated with a substrate to improve cell attachment uh, and growth. However, more and more researchers are exploring the use of, of more complex and advanced cell culture systems, such as three-dimensional cell culture systems, in an attempt to create model systems that better reflect how cells normally grow and behave in intact organisms. In other words, the ultimate goal is to make in vitro cell models that better reflect the complexity of human physiology. And so spheroids and organoids are two prominent examples of 3D systems that rely on cell aggregation to make such 3D cell structures. In addition to these, uh, there are so-called the, the organon chips uh, is another example of an advanced cell culture system that shows much promise and, and these technologies are also very rapidly advancing. Uh, organs on chips, uh, by, for other people, they're often called microphysiological systems and these are systems in which cells can be grown sort of in 2D or 3D and may also include things like extracellular matrices and other physiological cues such as shear flow and mechanical stimuli. These microphysiological systems may also have the advantage of being able to serially link multiple organotypic model systems to enable researchers to study interactions between organ-like systems. So to illustrate the rise in popularity of 3D model systems, this graph is more specific about organoids, but, but this graph is meant to show the increase in the number of publications from recent years that utilize organoids. And in part, this really underscores the reams of new data that suggests how 3D models can better approximate the in vivo physiology compared to traditional 2D models. And for me, of course, coming from a company standpoint, 
This observation is obviously a main driver of our interest in 3D model systems as we look for new ways to better enable our customers to, reach their, to meet their research needs. And to put this another way, um, some of the reasons why organoids are really gaining in popularity is that these stem cell derived models are probably the best available models uh, to study human embryonic development. In the past, much of what we've learned about human development has come from studying a variety of animal models that range from frogs and fish to chickens and mice and, and a whole bunch of others, and also from two-dimensional human stem cell culture. And as immensely valuable as these systems have been and continue to be at informing our understanding of human development, a mouse is still a mouse and not everything we learn from these animal models directly apply to humans. And this is particularly true of our understanding of drug metabolism, which in turn has a significant impact on the effectiveness of drug screening campaigns. As a result, there is, uh, seems to be a clear opening for new cell culture models such as spheroids and organoids that have the potential to help us better study and understand the mechanisms of human disease. And since these are stem cell derived systems, they can be coupled with iPSCs or induced pluripotent stem cells, uh, suggesting that they may also have other applications as medical research continues to march towards personalized medicine and personalized toxicology. So with that sort of brief introduction, uh, I'd like to move on to talk more specifically about spheroid and organoid models. And I think a good place to start is with some definition as these terms, spheroids, organoids, and even tumoroids, seem to often get used somewhat interchangeably. And I don't think this, this is really correct. And, and so, for, at least for the purposes of this presentation, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page when I refer to either spheroids uh, or organoids in this presentation. So it's clear that you know what I'm talking about. And so we've, defi we've defined spheroids as a 3D cellular aggregate composed of one or more cell types that can grow and proliferate and may exhibit enhanced physiological responses but do not undergo proliferation or cell organization. In other words, they, there isn't a stem cell compartment, so although you can aggregate these cells and they may uh, work together and, and improve their physiological responses, kind of the cells you put in the system is what you'll, you're, you will have for the duration of your experiment. In contrast, organoids um, can be defined as a 3D structure derived entirely from either PSCs or, or neonatal tissue stem cells or adult stem and progenitor cells, in which cells spontaneously self-organize into properly differentiated functional cell types and progenitors, and which resemble their in vivo counterparts and recapitulate at least some function of the organ. And this is a definition that, that we've been going with in-house here and this is derived from, from this reference you can see here, which is a very nice review paper on organoids. And lastly, I, I would like to mention tumoroids. Although I won't be talking about these systems for the rest of my presentation, I, I do want to take just a moment to, to head off any potential confusion that might exist between spheroids and tumoroids. Uh, just given that sometimes I, I hear people talk about spheroids and these, because they're derived from, often from cancer cell lines, I, I think there's sometimes a propensity to think of them as tumoroids, when really a tumoroid is, is, is a 3D cellular aggregate that's derived directly from uh, the primary uh, tumor tissue, if you will. And so it retains the properties of the original tumor and it can be propagated in vitro. And it does not have all the accumulated uh, effects that many cancer cell lines have after being cultured in the lab in, in 2D for, for many years. So as I mentioned, 3D models have great potential to improve the drug discovery process. And so what I'm showing here is kind of a generic slide that many of you have seen some version of before. And so I'll try not to belabor this slide too much. So this schematic represents the cost relationship in drug discovery, beginning with the screening of libraries of compounds to identify lead, lead candidates. And some of these candidates will ultimately make it into animal studies and clinical trials. So pharmaceutical companies often screen thousands and thousands of, of compounds to identify candidates that may have some therapeutic potential. 
And these large screening campaigns are typically performed using traditional 2D monolayer cultures um, because they are very useful at identifying highly toxic compounds, but in general they have very poor predictive value. However, the associated relative costs of these systems are quite low, and so they're often used as workhorses in the early stages of the drug discovery process. But as fewer and fewer compounds proceed through the drug discovery process, the associated costs tend to increase nearly exponentially. And this is why you often hear phrases such as, fail early, fail cheaply. Uh, so there seems to be a clear need uh, to improve this process so that fewer poor candidates make it out of the early stages of the drug discovery process. And of course, then this begs the question, can 3D models help improve this process? And so based on the evidence currently available in the scientific, scientific literature, and reports being presented by researchers in pharma, uh, it's indeed becoming clear that 3D models may be more predictive than traditional models. And what I mean by this is that spheroids, for example, are independently being shown to have different sensitivities to toxic compounds and show better predictivity than 2D cultures. And so as a result, spheroids and organoids could potentially fit somewhere in the middle or, or in the earlier steps of the standard drug discovery workflow and this could be of great benefit in making sure fewer but safer and, and perhaps even more efficacious drugs uh, progress through the drug discovery and development process. So this table that you're seeing here is, is taken from a really nice review paper. Uh, the reference is there on the bottom right. Um, and it summarizes some comparisons between 2D and 3D cultures with respect to several important cellular characteristics. Now, I'm not going to go through all of the, this table, but I would like to highlight just a, a couple of, of these points. So first of all are, are the two points in the bottom of the table. And the first of which here is that I just want to remind us that, you know, it's been shown by multiple people now that the gene and protein expression profiles found in 3D cell cultures are often much more similar to the gene and, expression, gene and protein expression profiles that are found in in vivo cell types as compared to the gene and protein signatures uh, that are often reported in 2D cultures. And secondly, that due to the three-dimensional nature of the spheroids, cells are often more resistant to drug exposure. And in some cases, this leads to them being better predictors of, drug, of in vivo drug responses. And this is in contrast to 2D cultures where drugs might often look extremely effective and early in the process, but then fail later on. And of course, this is associated with the addition of very significant uh, costs. Lastly is the fact that 3D structures or 3D cell models, um, in, in these models, nutrients growth factors and, and oxygen and drugs and, and such are not able to penetrate all the way through the spheroid core. And so this may be a negative for some people, but it may be a positive for other people, uh, for example, who, who might be looking to develop new cancer models. So with the last few slides, I've been trying to impress upon you that the improvements and potential advantages of using 3D models. And so next I'd like to take just a couple of slides to show some actual preliminary data that, that we've been working with in-house on spheroids uh, to study sort of general cytotoxicity. And so the image that you see here is a 2D image of a 3D spheroid that was formed from the hepatocarcinoma cell line HEPG2. And I want to show you this image to highlight several general features of spheroids. And I just want to mention that this is not new information. In fact, this is, is our version of what you can find in, in many published papers. And so the image that you see here is a fluorescent image. Uh, the blue fluorescence is just DAPI. It's meant to identify cell nuclei. And the green fluorescence that you see in the middle labels what's known as the necrotic core. And so the necrotic core typically forms in a spheroid when it reaches somewhere around maybe 150 to, to 300 microns in diameter, depending on the cell type that you're using. And, and this occurs really as a result of, of a couple of different things, uh, similar to what I mentioned on the previous slide. And that is there's an inability of oxygen and, and nutrients and growth factors and other uh, important things for good cell health that are in the cell culture media that are just not able to diffuse all the way through the 
the spheroid to the center to the cells in the center. And similar to this, then the cells in the center are also producing carbon dioxide and metabolic wastes, and these are unable to diffuse out of the core. And as a result, you get this hypoxic and necrotic center that develops. So other general features of the spheroid uh, are something that might be known to some as a quiescent zone. Uh, this is a, a region of cells within the spheroid that I, I tend to think of forming almost like a mantle underneath the outer cell layers and, and on top of the, the necrotic core. And this region is full of viable cells, but they tend not to be very proliferative. And lastly, the outer cells uh, of spheroids is where most of the proliferation is, is often observed. And, and, this is, and these are responsible for much of the spheroid growth that, that one would see. So although many in the audience are probably aware of, of some of this, but for those who, who, who aren't, I, I just want to mention a couple of common ways in which one can facilitate the formation of spheroids from uh, agreeable cell types. Uh, in some instances, for example, uh, spheroids uh, can be cultured uh, by starting with small clumps of cells or even single cells uh, grown in suspension or, or maybe in, in shaking cultures. And this tends to be a crude, but it is an efficient way to promote the formation of spheroids. Or if you happen to be using stem cells, this is one way to make embryoid bodies. However, this method often results in a wide range of sizes. And sometimes you, you get a bunch of different shapes of spheroids, and sometimes spheroids interact with each other and kind of merge. And so then you're dealing with, you know, are, are we really talking about one spheroid and, and that sort of thing. And, and so this can really have some unwanted downstream effects on, on your experiment. So although it, it does work, and it's certainly a very low-tech way of doing it, it, it does have its disadvantages. Uh, another method is the hanging drop method, which does work very well, but it tends to be quite tedious and can also be labor-intensive. Uh, it basically consists of pipetting a drop of culture medium, uh, usually with a, number, a known number of cells on the underside of tissue culture dish lids, and then you just invert them, and so you create a hanging drop. And the cells that you put into that culture media, just by gravity, tend to fall to the bottom of, of the drop, if you will, where the cells can interact and, and form an aggregate. Another really effective method that I find is, is the use of ultra-low attachment round bottom plates, uh, such as the, the sphera plates that, that are offered by NUNC. And so the round bottom allows cells to aggregate in one location at the bottom of the well. They're also ultra-low attachments, so they're, they're treated in a way to prevent cells from attaching, of course, to promote their interaction with each other. Um, and, and this format also gives you excellent control over the size of the spheroids that you're trying to form. And it also allows you to make sure you form one spheroid per well. And so, again, this circumvents some of the problems with, certainly with the static suspension or shaking cultures. And for anyone who's interested, I just wanted to, to point out that there is a really nice application note on the thermofisher.com website called Harnessing New Dimensions in Your Research, Coming Around to Spheroid Culture. And you can find some more information if you're interested there on, on the NUNC sphero plates. And, and also there, there's some really interesting info here on the history of, of spheroids and cultures, if that's something that might interest you. So the other thing that I find the, these plate formats very useful for uh, when it comes to forming spheroid plates is that they, they can, in some capacity, be used to or can be coupled with high content analysis and screening platforms such as the Salomic CX-7, uh, which is a seven-channel confocal high content screening Im instrument that's really good because it allows one to multiplex multiple fluorescent assays for phenotypic screening and you can use really powerful software to perform a wide range of different types of analysis to really measure any discernible effect that drug exposure uh, might have on cell health. And so this this, what I'm showing you here is an example of an experiment where we formed uh, HEP-G2 spheroids and exposed them to a 10-point, two-fold dilution uh, of four different drugs. Uh, and we evaluated these in four replicates, uh, in addition to the two lanes of controls that you can see make up the two left columns, where the outer, the, the leftmost column uh, were just untreated spheroids, and the second column 
was just made up, or sorry, were, were spheroids that were treated with just the DMSO vehicle control. And then we treated the, all these spheroids with different compounds um, and for 48 hours, and then we stained them with the HCS mitochondrial health kit, which simultaneously monitors cytotoxicity and mitotoxicity. And so just to explain this a little more, a, a healthy spheroid, such as in the controls on the left here, uh, only shows death really in the necrotic core. And, and in this over or this composite image, you, you can't really see the green fluorescence uh, at this resolution uh, that I'm showing here on the screen as the red stain that indicates healthy functional mitochondria really dominates the, the, the fluorescence here. Um, but what you can see then is in compounds one and three, which were known toxic compounds, um, that when we treat organoids with toxic compounds, you compl in some cases at the really high concentrations, which are on the left, you, you almost completely obliterate the, the spheroid that's formed. And so all you see are just a few cells that, that are labeled with green and or with, with DAPI, as you can see. But as you move across the, the plates uh, to the right at slightly lower concentrations, you can see that the size of the spheroids that are there are now slightly bigger. They're still showing toxicity in, in the sense that they're smaller than the controls. Uh, and you can also see uh, much more of the green fluorescence indicative of more general cytotoxicity. And then as you move to lower concentrations, uh, you, you can see that you're moving out of the concentration range, if you will, where toxicity uh, was detectable. And so here all you see again is the red fluorescence from, from the healthy, healthy functioning uh, mitochondria. And for comparisons, we have two compounds here, compounds two and four, which were known not to, to show any toxicity in, in this assay. So, um, yeah. So we also performed this, this same drug toxicity assay uh, and analyzed it with, with a different cell staining kit, but also on, on the CX7. So for this one, we repeated the assay exactly as, as I just described, and it was stained with the caspase, with the cell event caspase 3 7 reagent which is used to detect apoptotic cells, and we, of course, counterstain these with DAPI to, to identify all nuclei. And so what you can see here on the top left is that in controls, you can readily detect the necrotic core in, in the middle of these spheroids. And when you look then at drug-treated samples, you know, what's immediately obvious is, is that the size of the spheroid is smaller, uh, there are many more green or, or apoptotic cells that, that are now detectable. And so using the software as sort of represented in, in the images on the bottom here, uh, you can use the software to do any number of different types of measurements here to whether it's you're looking at the diameter or the surface area of the spheroid or you can, you can actually even count all the different uh, green and, and blue fluorescence and because it's a confocal, you can sort of take optical sections throughout the entire tissue. And so you can get a really nice multi-parametric readout of the state of health of the spheroids that, that you're working with. So I'd like to switch gears a little bit now and focus the rest of the talk just about organoids, which of course are another 3D cell culture system that's extremely interesting and may also have great application in the drug discovery process. Um, and as I described earlier, um, a defining feature of organoids is that they are formed from either pluripotent stem cells or adult stem and progenitor cells. And so the cartoon that, that I'll take you through next is based on using pluripotent stem cells, uh, which of course are either embryonic stem cells or iPSCs. So these pluripotent stem cells uh, have the capacity to differentiate into the three primary germ layers from which all cells in the body are derived. And these are the three layers, and David talked a little bit about this in his presentation. Uh, these are the endoderm, uh, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm. And each of these lineages makes unique contributions to the entire animal body plan. Uh, for example, the definitive endoderm uh, gives rise to the gastrointestinal tract, or at least the epithelium of the gastrointestinal tract, as well as many of the organs that sort of form during development from budding off this region, such as, as the liver and, and the lung and the pancreas and some others. Uh, the mesoderm gives rise to probably the, the bulk of, of the tissue in the body as it gives rise to all the muscle and, and bone and such. And I just highlighted a couple of here uh, for some reasons I'll come back to in a minute. 
that the mesoderm is also the source of kidneys and, and the heart. Uh, the ectoderm is, is sort of gives rise to two major parts. The ectoderm gives rise to the epidermis, uh, which of course forms your skin, uh, but it also gives rise to the central nervous system. And so over the past few decades, researchers have, have really identified many uh, of the extracellular signals, and in some cases the combinations of extracellular signals, uh, that promote the formation of these different cell types. And so more recently, there's been a lot of publications of protocols uh, that are usually based on these developmental signaling programs that have been shown to successfully start with PSCs uh, to generate organoids uh, that are representative of many different types of organs, such as all the ones that I've shown here on the screen. Um, and although it's not on the screen, I'm, I haven't shown it here in this cartoon, uh, several labs have also very successfully generated organoids, uh, such as intestinal and, and liver organoids, uh, from adult stem cells that were isolated from adult tissue biopsies or resections. And a main advantage of these systems is, is that the starting cells are already restricted in the types of cells they can become. And so they can differentiate oftentimes uh, into a more mature phenotype and exhibit better functionality than is typically achieved with PSC-derived organoids. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about this when, when I give an example from the literature in, in just a few slides from now. Um, the other thing that I'd like to point out is, is that this, of course, is, is not a complete list of all the published organoid systems. There are a number of others, and in some cases, there are multiple different approaches one can take to, to get to the same endpoint, end and these probably vary in some degree uh, based on their efficiency and the complexity of the different cell types that, that you end with. And so I just want to highlight a couple of review papers here on the bottom of the screen uh, for anyone who's listening who, who wants to learn more about this, uh, these are two really nice, really comprehensive uh, review system, uh, review papers where you can read up a, a whole lot more on, on the variety of different PSC and also adult stem cell uh, derived organoid systems. So over the next few slides, which are, are really just my last few slides, uh, one of the things I want to briefly highlight is, is just that, that there's a whole lot of different interesting papers that, that now util, utilize organoids and are working on really refining the protocols and, and really pushing this technology forward. And, and so all this slide is really meant to show here, it's just a few magazine clippings uh, to highlight a few uh, what I think of as some of the landmark papers uh, that have been published to successfully develop different types of PSC uh, derived organoids, uh, such as the intestinal uh, models, as well as different neural models where researchers have been able to generate organoid systems that recapitulate the cell complexity of different regions of, of the brain. So the two examples shown here are sort of the, the forebrain or the cerebral organoids, and as well as the midbrain-like organoids, which is where you find most of the uh, dopaminergic type neurons that, that David talked about uh, earlier as well. So many labs uh, have now been really successful in, in not only reproducing these protocols, but as I said, they're really continuing to push uh, these fields forward and, and really advance these, these fields in making the PSC derived organoids more and more mature and getting them as close as they can to, um, to a, a adult like organoids. Uh, or adult-like organs. Uh, and the reason I say this is that one of the key uh, limitations uh, often seems to be the level of maturity that, that these organoids uh, result in. And so often they retain a certain amount of fetal or perhaps neonatal phenotype. Uh, and so, you know, there is certainly a, lot, a concerted effort in, in trying to, to make these more mature. So a, a commonly cited example of PSC-derived organoids are the intestinal organoids, which of course develop with all the different epithelial cell types that are normally present in the human intestinal epithelium. And so the paper that I clipped here is really, it's, it's a great study that demonstrates how PSC-derived intestinal organoids can be used to recreate a, a key feature of Clostridium difficile infection, or, or C. diff infection, if you will, uh, which is the disruption of the intestinal epithelial barrier function. And so th this paper is a nice sort of, uh, it's a host pathogen kind of disease model. 
And so, as you may know, uh, C. diff bacteria causes a, a very serious infection, uh, and it's often, or, and it's generally implicated in about 14,000 deaths annually, and is usually contracted by patients who are already in the hospital for other issues. And so, these infections often disrupt the integrity of the gut epithelium, and can cause severe diarrhea and lethal toxic megacolon. And so, this infection also tends to be very recalcitrant to antibiotic treatment, and existing 2D cell culture models do not accurately recapitulate this disease in a dish. So there, there's, of course, a very uh, strong limitation there in the ability to screen for new uh, effective drugs to treat these infections. And so what the researchers in this paper uh, were able to do then was that they were able to demonstrate that in a dish, intestinal organoids form a lumen that also has a very good uh, paracellular barrier that effectively prevents stuff from sort of leaking from the lumen and out through the organoid. And they showed this by directly injecting a four kilodalton fluorescent dextran directly into the lumen and then just monitoring the retention of the fluorescent molecules in the organoid. And so if you look in part A of this figure, the, the top panel is, is the fluorescent images of this assay where short, immediately after injection at zero hours, uh, this is the level of fluorescence that, that you can see from the injected dextran. Uh, and there's a pretty good retention of the amount of fluorescence over the 12 and 18 hours that this assay was designed for. And so what the researchers were able to do then was they, they repeated this assay where they injected either a bolus of, of viable C. diff or they could even get the same result simply by injecting individually uh, the two toxins that C. diff bacteria is known to secrete uh, and, and that, are, that form a, a major part of the reason why this bacteria causes such problems. And so what you can see here then is that over the same time frame, the toxin A, which is the middle row of panels, and toxin B, which is the bottom row of panels, there, there's certainly for cat, in, in the case of toxin A, there's a dramatic loss in, in the amount of, of fluorescent or fluorescence being detected in, in the lumen of, of these organoids. And to a lesser extent, uh, toxin B also worked, uh, but just wasn't as, uh, as severe as A. And, and what this underscored, of course, what, what, is that the two different toxins actually contribute to the, um, to the infection or, or to the pathology of, of, of the issue uh, in, in different ways. And so the authors were able to go on and, and describe some of these contributions uh, that these toxins make, or at least propose the mechanisms of them. Uh, and this seemed to be in pretty good agreement with the, the existing information uh, about these toxins that, that's in the primary literature. And so really my take home message from this study that, that I want you to remember is that these researchers were able to use their 3D model systems in a dish to develop an assay that you cannot do in 2D, and it's a functional assay that they developed and they're now in a position where if someone was interested, uh, and I'm sure somebody is, <laughs> is to use this functional assay to screen for more effective drugs that may be able to use to treat these, these deadly infections. And so similar to, to the slides that I just went through, uh, I also want to, to spend a few minutes talking about uh, sort of a case study, if you will, of, of adult stem cell derived organoids. And so there, there are fewer, these are fewer in number than the PSC uh, derived organoid protocols and, and probably for obvious reasons. Uh, but these again are a couple of really important papers I think that, that help describe how uh, to make or isolate adult stem cells and, and form these uh, organoid systems uh, in a dish starting with adult stem cells. And so these, of course, have to be isolated from tissue biopsies or, or resections. And so a couple of the clippings that I've shown here um, are, are with respect to making uh, adult colon organoids or uh, rectal organoids or, or as well as uh, organoids derived from cells isolated from adult human liver. And so Lastly, I'm just going to give a brief snapshot of how these organoids uh, can be applied to disease modeling and drug discovery. So the papers that I'm showing here uh, developed a model for, for studying cystic fibrosis. 
And so cystic fibrosis is a disease that's caused by uh, many different mutations uh, that occur in a transmembrane conductance transporter protein called CFTR. Uh, and this CFTR is expressed in many different epithelia, but perhaps most notably as it relates to cystic fibrosis, uh, these would include the lung epithelia, the colon and, and rectum epithelia, and I believe it's also expressed fairly prominently in the biliary epithelia in the liver as well. And so these two sister studies that I have up here on the screen uh, both come from the Beekman lab. And they described the development of an assay where they could successfully distinguish between normal and cystic fibrosis or CF patient-derived uh, rectal organoids simply by treating the organoids with uh, a compound called uh, forskolin, which, which is a cyclic AMP inducer. And, and so what this does in healthy control organoids that forskolin induces the secretion of fluid into the lumen of the organoids, which causes them to swell. And so if you look at these images on the right, sort of in the, in the left column on the bottom, where under control and WTWT, uh, this is what the adult organoids, the adult rectal organoids look like after treatment with forskolin, where they've swollen uh, to a, a particular size. And the three panels uh, above these controls, or above the wild type, uh, are organoids that were derived from patients that had different uh, mutations in the CFTR gene. And what you can see with these is, is that they are far more recalcitrant, or, or basically they do not undergo any swelling uh, upon treatment with this forskolin protein. And so immediately they had an assay now where you can distinguish between, like I said, healthy or, or disease um, uh, organoids. And, and I would like to point out that on the, the, the labels on the far right, the F508 Dell and the others, uh, th this is just nomenclature for some of the different mutations that were present in the uh, patients from which these organoids were, were derived. And, and the F508 Dell is an amino acid deletion that I think is the most prominently associated um, mutation with, with this disease. And so the right column then is the result of, of what, where the authors were able to test several different drugs, and in this case, th this picture just shows two different drugs, that were at the time at least in, in clinical trials. And, and what they found was if they treated the patient-derived organoids that showed no swelling in the controls in the untreated sample, uh, if they then treated them with these different uh, clinical trial drugs, they could rescue significantly the swelling phenotype, suggesting that they, you know, th this was a positive uh, result for, for the drugs in terms of being something that may have therapeutic potential. And what was then also quite remarkable was that this information all correlated extremely well with the, clinic, with the actual clinical trial data uh, that the authors had access to. So again, this was another really great proof of principle study demonstrating that not only can organoids be used to screen for new drugs, uh, but this technology could also be used in conjunction with genetics uh, in order to stratify the spectrum of disease subtypes and may one day be used for personal toxicology to identify more effective treatments uh, especially in, in cases where multiple treatments, uh, multiple options for treatments may exist and there's some confusion over which treatment uh, is best tailored to, to the particular individual. And so with that, uh, I'd just like to go through, through this last slide. Uh, so hopefully you found some of this sort of review-like type information uh, somewhat interesting. And before I finish, I just wanted to make a couple of additional comments in the sense that although these 3D model systems have come a long way um, and are really exciting and hold a lot of promise, uh, I think it's still a little bit early to think of them as a straight up substitute for 2D models. And so what I'd like to stress is that there are still a number of different issues that I think is important for, for those of you in the audience, for example, who may be thinking about currently using these systems or, or are currently using these systems. Uh, and so some of the things I'd like to point out or to remind people that they need to consider when they're using these systems is that these generate, 
but there are inconsistencies still in, in generating the organoids. And what I mean by this is that organoids, after going through the protocol, they often comprise of different sizes of different cell populations. Uh, and, and so by having variable numbers of, of different cell types within the organoid, it makes it a little difficult to compare organoid to organoid, for example. And so there, there, there's still a lot of effort going into further refining these protocols to try and make these more consistent. Uh, and some of this may come down to, you know, applying a certain level of bioengineering uh, or incorporation of things like designer matrices, uh, which would uh, sort of substitute or, or overcome some of the limitations uh, of using ECM or, or tumor-derived ECM-like uh, substances, such as matrigel, just for example. Uh, these designer matrices are purely synthetic and tunable, and they can be impregnated with, with peptides where you can maybe more accurately uh, generate what the ECM looks like uh, in vivo for the cell or the organoid type that, that you're interested in. And so kind of the extension from this then is that since there are multiple cell populations within these organoids, this can really complicate data interpretation since if, if your setup is to do more uh, biochemical type analyses and if you're actually interested in understanding either the biology or if you're looking at mechanisms of action, for example, it's, it can be very difficult to know what drug or what cell type you know, your, your drug treatment is actually affecting. And so some of the ways around this in, in the future may be to, to lean a little more heavily on, on incorporating cell labeling or cell tracing um, components to, to your organoids so that you can then you know, insert them into a more high content type analysis where you can look at all the different cell types simultaneously but distinguish the effects uh, that you may be seeing to a given cell type. And the last point that I, I'd, I'd like to just bring up is that it's still important to remember that these things are not in a normal microenvironment, and oftentimes they also lack vasculature. And so although a lot of the protocols do incorporate the use of ECM proxies, such as designer matrices or, or gel tracks and these sorts of things, um, it, it is still a proxy. And so it is still not exactly the same as the normal microenvironment. Uh, and in particular, most of the published protocols do not straight up develop their own vasculature. There may be a couple of exceptions to that, uh, but there are also some efforts where people are incorporating a vascular component into their protocol in order to kind of overcome this limitation. And, and perhaps in the future, uh, using or, or coupling these organized systems with, with more advanced uh, technology such as microfluidics might be a, another way to, to try and reduce this, this limitation. So with that, I'd like to, to thank everyone who, who stayed around and, and listened or new people who, who joined for, the, for this short talk. Um, I, I think there is a question and answer period uh, coming up at some point in the not too distant future. Uh, but in the meantime, if, if there are any other questions you have, um, feel free to, to email me and, and I, I will do my best to, to get back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Piper and Dr. Kennedy for your presentations. So a quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions, simply type them in the Q&A box found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Dr. Piper and Dr. Kennedy will answer as many questions as time permits. And the first question from the audience is for both speakers, and it is, what role do you see stem cells and or 3D models playing in drug discovery in the future? Dr. Kennedy, would you like to go first? Uh, sure, I can give it a go. Um, so I, I think there's still a lot of promise in, in using iPSCs and, and stem cells in the drug discovery um, process. Uh, I think the ability to scale these cells and, and certainly generate lines from a wide variety of different genetic backgrounds uh, are all clear advantages that, that existing platforms may not offer. And certainly in the case of, of 3D models, I, I think that these, you know, they, they, there does seem to be certainly a, a building of evidence that, that really suggests that these, the increased complexity of these systems um, really leads to these cells being able to better predict whether a drug is toxic and, and they might even be more useful for doing things like um, 
studies of efficacy that existing 2D models, for example, um, don't address necessarily very well. Uh, so, so I think there is definitely a future there. I think there is still some development that, that needs to happen uh, in, in order to develop these systems into uh, formats that lower the activation energy of entry, if you will, uh, so that you know, they can fit seamlessly into existing workflows. Uh, so I think part of that might be the limitation right now as well. But, but I think that there's a very bright future for these systems in that process. Dr. Piper? <clears throat> yeah, I, you know, I think uh, as we continue to move forward in the drug discovery process, um, you know, IPSCs offer an ability to generate cells that are ordinarily not available. Um, certainly, to examine the biology or pathology of, of disease in, in human neurons uh, is a real challenge. So first of all, being able to generate specific cell types that are, that are representative of human biology, I think will be uh, of great importance. It, I mean, it's happening already, but as Mark said, scale uh, continues to, to require some improvements to drive that towards, I think, larger screening applications. And I think the screening applications, while we often think about efficacy or safety, um, I think they'll also be used potentially for target identification and validation. And I think the next obvious piece is to combine the ability to use IPSCs, the ability to generate isogenic pairs uh, with some of the 3D modeling uh, that Mark just spoke about so that you can create uh, in vitro models that are much more indicative of what may be happening in, in a tissue, if not an organ, uh, if not a human being. Um, so uh, this will take some time, but certainly uh, I think it will support more translatable and predictable models that will help us uh, reduce the development time associated with, with uh, therapy development. Thank you both for that. Um, this next one is for you, Dr. Piper. Is this human episomal IPSC CAS9 line available for purchase? Uh, it is available as a as a customized product. We don't have it uh, in our catalog per se. We use it on my teams, and people have requested it. We do provide custom services as part of our organizational functions. So anyone that's interested can reach out to the email shown here on the screen, discovery services at thermofisher.com, uh, to inquire about that. Hey, Dr. Piper, will CRISPR-Cas9 work in non-dividing cells? Uh, yes, yeah, so you can get double-stranded breaks in non-dividing cells. Um, however, mo the, they typically are reduced to non-homology end-joining repair. I don't think that we typically see homology-directed repair in non-dividing cells. Um, now, that said, uh, there have been reports um, of using other repair mechanisms. Um, so I believe uh, Juan Carlos uh, Belmonte's lab has shown that you can get homology-independent targeted integration that leverages the non-homologous end-joining pathway. I'm not sure what kind of uh, efficiencies can be expected there. Uh, but again, I think uh, you know, continued technology development will, will certainly allow for those sorts of manipulations. And this next one is for you too, Dr. Piper. Do you have a special media for circulating tumor cells (CTCs) from melanoma patients? Um, you, you know, I'm afraid that we don't. Um, we do have a very significant offering of basal media and supplements that can be used for many different cell types. Uh, I think some of our epithelial medias might be, might be used. We certainly also have a, a large number of medias that support hematopoietic cells, so it may depend on the type and nature of the CTCs. Um, that's not my area of domain expertise, but I'm, I'm not certain that they can all be characterized identically, uh, so I think there may be some patient-specific pieces that need to be understood and addressed. So, don't have a specialized system for that, 
but certainly have a lot of the parts that could be put together uh, for specific applications. This next one is for you, Dr. Kennedy. Do you think that 3D cultures could be utilized to build chronic toxicity dosing models versus acute tox models available today? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I, I think that it would be very difficult to do with, with an organoid model, depending on, on the type of model you're looking for. Um, so, for example, if you're looking for a, a liver model, I, or a, a liver organoid model, I should say, I, I don't know that there's a, a robust enough uh, process or, or protocol defined um, to, to be able to do that. However, I, I think spheroids might be a little more applicable here uh, using primary hepatocytes, for example, one of the key advantages uh, of using hepatocytes or, or primary cells in, in, in 3D cultures is that there, there's a, a major increase in the, in the lifespan of, of these cells. So, so typically in, in 2D culture, for example, a uh, primary hepatocyte might, might only survive for four to five days under, under normal conditions. Uh, somewhere in that area anyway, so certainly you're, you're not able to do any uh, long-term or chronic dosing uh, with that kind of format. I know there are some improvements to, to that. There are some media supplements such as the, uh, the Hepextend supplement that, that I believe is a catalog product uh, at, at Thermo Fisher, and with that you can extend the lifespan of, of 2D cultures, uh, but getting to 3D um, you know, people have repeatedly shown, and we've seen this ourselves as well, is, is that it, it becomes pu putting primary hepatocytes into 3D allows them to, instead of growing for four or five or six days, it, it's much easier to take them out for three weeks, maybe even four weeks. So I think in, in, in terms of using spheroids, there's certainly an opportunity to, or an ability to do a, a chronic type of, of dosing assay uh, currently. Okay. This next one is for you, for Dr. Piper. Where within the workflow is typically the most challenging? And it's a two-parter, so let me know if you need me to repeat the second part. Do you have any tips and tricks to help increase the likelihood of success in building IPSC-derived disease models? Yeah, sure. So, you know, in our hands, I think the most challenging part really is generating the single-cell clones. So, um, you know, my my very strong tip there would be to uh, test the ability to use StemFlex media with your cells. Uh, if you don't have a fax sorter, you should be able to uh, do single cell dilution plating and still drop, you know, one or less than one cell per well. Um, you won't, you know, without a fax sorter, you won't be able to be sure that you're not dropping a clump. But that is a significant time saver for us and takes out a lot of the tedium uh, and removes a great deal of the unpredictable nature. Um, certainly delivery is very important uh, and I think if you want to use patient derived lines um, using the Cas9 nuclease protein pre-complexed with IBT guide RNAs uh, is a very good way to approach uh, getting the tools in to get good delivery and good editing efficiencies. Um, if it's possible to insert a mutation, certainly we're demonstrating that the stable Cas9 line has been very effective, uh, but either of those methods should work very well. Great. And it looks like we have time for one more question, and it is for you, Dr. Kennedy. Do you think that 3D models are better or more predictive, and what about the cost? Yeah, so that's, uh, that, that's a great question. I was, in some ways, I was waiting to hear that one. Um, so I think that there's really a, a burden of evidence in, in the literature right now that, at least in, in some capacities, uh, I think 3D models can show better predictivity. Um, I, I, there aren't a lot, at least that I'm aware of, uh, not a lot of core facilities that are just uh, straight up incorporating these into their assays. I think there's still a lot of people who are evaluating it for themselves in-house, uh, apart from what you find in, in the basic literature or in the primary literature. Uh, but, but I think that, you know, that depending on, on what your readout is, I, I think, or, or what your metrics are, I, I think that 3D models are showing better predictivity, yes. Uh, with respect to the costs, uh, that's still a challenging one because some of these are, are time consuming. Uh, some of them 
require specialty plastics. Uh, it's in some way a little unclear how they may fit directly into existing workflows. Uh, and if you're using a service company, for example, that may pr be providing these, uh, I, I know from what I've been hearing, these can be quite expensive. And so I think people who are exploring this are, are still doing it in somewhat limited capacity. And so I, I don't, I hesitate to try and put any particular or any specific type of associated value on it. But, but I would say it, it's still a little bit of a, a costly endeavor, uh, depending on the scale at which you are, are looking to, to use these models in. I would like to once again thank Dr. Piper and Dr. Kennedy for their presentations. Do you have any final comments? No, just thanks again to the participants for joining us today, and uh, we wish you the best in, in your own research. And ditto for me. Thanks, everyone, for, for taking the time to join us, and I really hope some of what you heard today was very useful and will help you with your own research endeavors. Thanks again to you both. I'd also like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today will be answered after the presentation. We would like to thank our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand through November 2017. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available, available for replay, and we encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.